Hola, hola. Also giving a talk. Ah. So I was wondering, do you want to give the talk okay. here? Hope you had a nice uh, yes. pika pika yeah. break. Yeah. I can give it to you. So yeah, welcome everyone back to this uh, second session, which is entitled Planet in Focus, Dialogues on uh, Ecosystems and Global Health. Um, so different, if you were here this morning, different to this morning, now we will have more scientific oriented uh, session, which is focusing in planetary biology. So planetary biology, as you know, includes multiple disciplines from ecology, molecular biology, biogeochemistry, ecosystems. We look at different dimensions of life and also on uh, societal challenges uh, related to planetary health. Um, so in the first, uh, I mean, this second session will have two parts. The first part, there will be research that is more related perhaps to TREK and to research that we do here in, at the ICM and other institutes as well. Um, we will have three uh, speakers in the first part for, um, uh, from the CSIC and also from EMBO. And then uh, we will have a coffee break at 4.30, half an hour, please be sharp. And then we will have another part of the session, which is a broader. Uh, we try to link with our topics to, to increase our breadth. And then we'll have talk from East Global, from the uh, UPF, uh, and also from CREAF. Um, so there will be five minutes for questions each session. And now it's my pleasure to present our keynote, Don Colomban de Vargas. <laughs> uh, so he will explain us, uh, well, planetary biology. Welcome, Colomban. Thank you, Ramiro. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Ramiro. I feel very honored to be a Don. <laughs> Can you hear me, or even if I move? I think, yeah. yeah I, I have a mic here. Yeah, OK. I hope it's OK. So uh, yes, I, I want to share um, <clears throat> some thoughts uh, about, yes, this big world of, of planetary biology. And I think, yes, to start with, I think really uh, everything, I mean, a big push to planetary biology was when we saw this picture from Mission Apollo. This was about my age, actually. You know, it's uh, about 50 years ago. And um, when we saw that this picture, you know, of, of, the, of, the, of the Earth system from the moon, this was really when, you know, the, we realized that we, we better understand this object uh, because we really don't want to live on, on this one, right? And so I think this was, this was at the same time very beautiful, magnificent, but also very scary. And a lot of the Earth system sciences started after this picture, which really literally changed, the, I, I think, the mindset of, of humanity. <clears throat> but when we realized that we should do actually biology, not only planetary Earth system science, but bi planetary biology. I think it's much later, it's about 25 years later, toward the end of the 90s, where when we started to have the picture, when the satellite developed sensors good enough to measure the, mainly the color of the ocean and the spectrum of color coming from the ocean. And this picture also uh, from the NASA was amazing. This was a sea waves picture in 97. And yeah, you, we, can, we could see that we discovered, of course, that you had this this beating, this breathing, right, of the, of the Earth, of the, of the systems we know, we know of, right, the macro, macroscopic systems, the forest, for instance, that you can see here really breathing with, with the yearly cycle. But also we discovered that the, the Earth system is full of, of, of an invisible life, microbes, and we could compute from this data that microbes actually, today, in, just in the ocean, making up half of, uh, of, of biological carbon and, 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 the, and the planetary oxygen. <coughs> So the planet is definitely full, full of life. We know from the geological record that this life and the, the invisible life has actually evolved for 80% of the time of life on Earth. It was exclusively microbial, invisible. There were viruses, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, but no plants and animals. And the plants and animals came up into a, a system that was already totally wired up, right? These microbes developed all the enzymes for the redox chemistry, uh, making up all the global biogeochemical cycles of the planet. And in fact, we are simply visitors of a, of, a, of a world that was running, that was already oxidized, that was totally running. So I'm not sure, yeah. <coughs> so this is a very important fact as well from the geological record. The, li the life as we know it today has, I think, two, there are two main 
factors that really are shaping life, mostly the, the strongest one. The first is tectonics, which act on the order of 10 to 100 million years old. Uh, old. And we had already six of these events of assemblages and disassemblages of, of continents. And then the, the, um, <coughs> the orbital parameters, the Milinkovitch cycles, those are the parameters, precession, obliquity, eccentricity, which act at scales of uh, 100 to 10, um, thousand years, and these, these are the factors you know, that create the glaciation. Biology is acting on top of that, but this, this is really what is controlling uh, life on, on the planet. Now, it's not totally true because this is cyclic parameters, but what is beautiful is that life itself evolves, get, getting more complex, and in fact, it became a, a real geological force. And if you see the long you know, vision of the planet evolution, across geological time, you can see how actually very important mechanism of life. I mean, life is always inventing new uh, enzymes, mechanisms, species, behavior that really you know, can change the, ge the geology of, of the planet. And the planet is really evolving like a, like a living creature. <coughs> one, of the, one example, for instance, is when coccolithophores, when this cell started about 200 million years ago to invent this coccolith, this was the first invention of calcification, intracellular calcification, and just this fact, you know, this invention totally changed the, 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 the reservoir of carbon on the planet. Building up here in the Cretacé, you can see this um, cliff, um, <coughs> the cliff of Dover, 90 meters. This is just um, 30 million years of uh, sedimentation of coccolithophore, you know, which we, even us humans, haven't been able to create this kind of uh, change in the, in the biosphere. <coughs> So I think what is fascinating is that you invent new domains of life. Of course, you have extinction, but you, I mean, these big, you know, things that work really well and that change the chemistry of the Earth, then they are part of the system. And life can become really a, a geological force. <coughs> so I think this is really what we aim to understand now in the next 50 years in this new field of, uh, I think, in this emerging field of planetary biology. And for me, planetary biology started with, with this amazing guy, Eric Carsanti. And Eric Carsanti used to be the, the head of um, <coughs> the Department of Cell Biology and Biophysics at EMBL. And he is an expert of self-organization at the cellular level. So Eric spent most of his life trying to understand how molecules, through collective behavior, uh, and you know, uh, reaction diffusion equations with the uh, feedbacks, create shape. And sometimes this shape take, take up functions and then uh, become something stable that stabilizes the evolution of genomes. I think this is evolution more than selection, uh, the, how life really takes shape. And uh, when we met Eric at that time, Eric is also a great sailor, and he, he showed us this movie of, uh, that we were doing at the NBL at this time, that you can see here now, I will show you. This was a spin microscopy movie of all cells of a zebrafish dividing. So each, you see the division of the, of the little embryo, taking shape. And so when I saw this, you know, 15 years ago, this was 15 years ago, I told myself, okay, let's follow this guy. <laughs> and he was also offering a, a cruise, you know, across the, the global ocean. So this was a dream, basically. Huh? And we <clears throat> immediately thought also, maybe the Earth system should have some, you know, sh should be, we should be able to model the Earth system also through, uh, um, you know, um, self-organization principles. <clears throat> In fact, what I fundamentally believe is that you have, you know, in, I mean, in, in, the, in the organization of, of, living matter, of living matter, you have space sometimes where you can understand things which are well, well constrained, like the cell. I think uh, eventually an organism, but also the planet is a very well constrained system, right? It's, a, it's easy, it has a boundary, it's an object we can see now from space and that we can start maybe eventually one day to understand. <coughs> there are, I think, part of this complexity of life which we will never understand. I'm not sure we will ever understand ecosystem, really. Ecosystem may be too chaotic <laughs> and, and too open to, to need to, uh, to, 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 uh, to understand any time. So I think that's why I think the term planetary biology is interesting and is really needed. It's not like ecology, it's really biology at the level of the planetary scale. <coughs> so how do we do that? Um, and so I will just show you now how we did that very quickly and I will come back also to Trek, the current expedition. And uh, so this is a slide I, I made at one of the first uh, meetings uh, with Eric at the time. You could, I mean, say that this is an ecosystem with metabolism, redox chemistry, ultrastructure stuff, you know, shapes, um, um, 
forms. And behavior, of course, very important. You could place eventually all life in this triangle of, uh, of ecosystems with the prokaryotes, uh, the protists, the single uh, cell eukaryotes here, and the, and the metazoans, the animals here. In the plankton, which is great, is that we don't have plants. So that's, a mirror. that's I, th I think, why plankton may be the best complex systems to understand, is that because the entry of energy into the system is made by single-celled organisms, which simplify a lot the, the understanding of, of this complex system. <coughs> of course, then you have to understand this. Ah, yes, you have the virus lubricating the, the whole system. And you have to understand this in the, in the physics and biochemical matrix, where the systems evolve and across space and time. <coughs> and so it's a huge challenge, of course, right? Because we are just today having the technologies being able to observe this, this parameter space. But we were brave enough with Eric and, and, and Chris Bowler and Gabi Gorski and a few others to, to jump into the big bath and in Tara Oceans we explore the <coughs> life across all scales of taxonomy from viruses to animals across different levels of our organization, DNA, express genes and organisms basically, and at planetary scales for four years. <coughs> and we were, we were careful to choose each station, each site of Tarashans within systems from which we knew the history of the water mass. It was really carefully decided from uh, analysis, uh, satellite analysis. analysis. <coughs> and of course, measuring also plenty of contextual parameters. So this was the first time, I think, to my knowledge, where we had this uh, big, big data set trying to explore. The idea really was to, ex to, to be at the boundary of ocean, of ocean scale ecosystems and to explore the parameter space with a very systematic way not knowing what we were going to do. I mean, Eric tried to write an ERC about that. It was rejected, of course. <laughs> and so, you, uh, Tara is in town. Uh, it just arrived this morning. You can visit it. So I really encourage you to visit it because you, you can see that how the lab has evolved since then. Uh, and um, yeah, we came back after three years and then we did, did another tour of the Arctic Ocean, so first it was a beautiful adventure, so we were already the pioneer of planetary biology. <laughs> and we came back with, uh, you know, visiting 210 stations at three different depths. So it was about 600 states of these global ocean ecosystems, 40,000 samples, and a lot of contextual parameters. <clears throat> a lot of the papers we published out of this, and we had a special issue in science, was discovery of new genes, new species, new, you know, uh, unknown things, changing paradigms of nitrogen fixation. Of, uh, so we did a lot of discovery. But I think what, I, what impressed me mostly is that some parameter space, we really reached the boundary. For instance, the ribosomal sequences, we saw the, the boundary of we were not sequencing any more ribosomes, which was amazing, meaning that, you know, we, we, we did the complete circle of, of this uh, parameter. And you, we have to realize also that this field where we are really exploring like, uh, you know, like uh, blind people, <laughs> it takes a lot of time then to assemble this data because we have to create a uh, you know, pluridisciplinary team and work out the data for, for a long time. And much later actually came out the papers where we build up a global interactome of plankton. We use methods to, to uh, reinforce the statistics of this, uh, of this interactome and build some sub network of the, of the global plankton network and we could link the, the sub-networks to, to uh, ecosystem, service, to ecosystem um, functions, like here the carbon uh, pump, because we had an underwater visual profiler. And so we could extract the, yes, the network of life linked to the carbon pump. And for instance, here we discovered that some viruses, the one infecting um, Cinecococcus, are very good predictors of the, of the carbon flux to the, to the bottom of the ocean. So those are just hypotheses, of course, based on a relatively limited number of of a time and, and point, time, time space point. <coughs> but um, yeah, but interesting, uh, yeah, we showed that we can go basically from genes to, to planetary uh, function, which I think was, uh, was, ni was nice. We also, in this paper, which was led by Daniel Rich Richter, who is currently in, the, in this, uh, in this at, at ICM, <coughs> we took, we, we could compare the whole metagenomic samples by comparing k mers on, on reads and uh, we could compare the distance between all the metagenomic samples of different size fractions to the transit time of the water. Because, of course, in the ocean, the dynamics is super fast, and we could use a model of MIC follows, the Darwin model, to compare the, the distance, the difference, the, this metagenomic distances to transit time. And we discovered that, actually, all these 
So we, we computed the, the shortest transit time between the stations based on this model. And we could uh, see that the pair of, st of stations that were linked by less than one year had always less than 12% genomic similarity. And we discovered this very interesting, you know, sort of um, <coughs> relationship between community similarity based on all metagenomic read and travel time. <coughs> so there is a sort of a rule which vary a bit across size fractions, but which is lost after one or one or two years. After two years, you don't have any more of this relationship. This seems to be the longest time to which you know, the ocean currents is linked to, the, to shaping the, 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 the community. Those rules, I think, are fundamental, right? Because this is really the beginning of first order principles of uh, plankton planetary ecology. <coughs> How much time do I have? <laughs> Eight minutes? Okay, so maybe, oh yeah. well, this one I will switch. Yeah, well, I will, I will um, switch this one, but just to, to say that we, we use different optical. This is the last paper that was just submitted to science last week. And yeah, just to show you that it takes a lot of time, you know, this was 15 years ago, basically. But, uh, <coughs> but it took a long time also because we had no one, but we, we analyzed images of plankton f using different instruments from flow, flow cytometry, fluorescent in situ microscopy, um, flow cam, etc. all different instruments to, to, to measure the whole spectrum of plankton. And we had the first time, we could for the first time show that the pyramid of, of, um, of life in the plankton is inverted in most stations. And actually the most important organisms of plankton are, are these jellies, right? More, much more than microbes, it seems to, at least in the, yes, for the carbon. And, uh, <coughs> After that, so just the, the, my point here is that Bon, it was very brief to build up this data set, and then it takes a lot of time, many years of work to understand the data, to build up, and to, to find out first, you know, planetary scale description of the, of the system. <coughs> After that, we were a bit crazy enough with Tara to, to do other expedition. We did a Tara Pacific expedition in blue here, and we did, a, during the COVID time, we did this yellow uh, mission microbiome expedition. And interestingly, I think we, we were in Terra Pacific, we are analyzing the island effect and the coral reefs. In Mission Microbiome, we were analyzing really the, the we start to analyze the relationship between land, between um, rivers, or different uh, parameters, and the, and the ocean. So we get closer to the, to, the, to the land. You can see a beautiful picture here of, uh, we studied the effect of um, icebergs on, uh, on plankton. <coughs> and the last, the last idea came, came out from uh, Per Bork, and it was a lunch time, uh, at, uh, at one of these Tara meetings, and, and I remember because Edith was just about, she was not yet the director of ENBA, but she was about to start. And Edith really had at heart to start a planetary biology program at EMBL, and Per had this brilliant idea to, to do a, <coughs> a land-sea interface uh, program called TREK. <coughs> so I will show you a bit what we, so TREK is occurring now. We started last, uh, last April in Roscoff. We have done all this part, and we are now in, in in Barcelona, and we will do the Mediterranean part of it. <coughs> and the beauty, I think, of it is that we are really at the interface between extreme systems. And so the expedition really explores the interactions between the two major and highly divergent ecosystems, land and sea. <coughs> uh, and so basically, I, I will show you a bit how we, how we, uh, how we have planned. Yeah, what is also funny, I think, is that because <laughs> there are not a lot of you know, theoretical ecologists or or mathematician in this team, so we, we build up a bit the, the sampling plan relatively randomly, <laughs> but uh, we hope we are, we are good enough uh, in, in, this, uh, in this game. And so, we, <clears throat> so the idea was to, so we have a, a soil sediment shallow water team, sampling team, that you can see, you can see picture of this team here. And they are the one, actually, no, they're, they're, it's not true what I said, because Samuel is an incredibly good uh, soil ecologist in Paris at the NS. And Samuel was the one who chose most of the land sites based on mainly climatology, geomorphology, geology, vegetation. And so we choose uh, along the European coastline all these sites. <clears throat> and also we choose you know, sites which are contrasting in terms of anthropic and natural um, systems. Of course, you have nothing more, any more natural in Europe, but we try to contrast these sites. And then we design um, <clears throat> a, stati a statistical sampling design going from you know, something different patterns of five cores of soils going closer to the ocean to have soils that are more, more and more influenced in elevation to the ocean. So the land team actually has very good ecologists and really decide where to put these, these patterns. And then we have a sediment sampling design which looks like that. 
and the water design, <coughs> a shallow water sampling, which is just one, one, uh, one um, site in front of them. <coughs> so you can see here pictures of the team on land. So we have, it has been a crazy year, so learning how to do this. <coughs> with, this is a sediment team sampling course in different sediments, sandy, rocky, laguny, muddy. <coughs> It was funny because basically we, the lab I showed you on Tara, we basically put it on wheel just to, to make the same protocol on wheel. <coughs> we also have a very interesting program with Rafael Esciano who is coring deep enough to reach pre-industrial times to see the evolution of the system across time. And we are do, also working in time series with marine stations all along the European coast. This is basically reaching the, the 40, right, the time, <coughs> the time scale of, this, of these ecosystems. <coughs> And then the, the Stara Europa expedition. This was just uh, last week in Spain. This was in the Medes Island, I think. <coughs> and the, the team on board. So we have four really amazing engineers. So for the ocean, we, we basically, yes, the ocean, the ocean sampling is based on the, on the land sampling. So we, once the land sampling is, is organized, we have to, to make sure about the, we sample at the right depth. The tide is super important. We, we sample it each time at, 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 at slack time, at low tide. And we, then we have a team working with satellite data that use climatology data to make sure that we are putting the station in the right based on past climatological data and also a near real time data. And also uh, we have a really nice setup, fully automated underway sensing system on, on Bortara to take the final decision of the station. So the stations are really decided very carefully in advance. <coughs> so it's a lot of work, all of this. Uh, we have an interactive map to follow the the, 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 the trip you, that you actually I can give you the link if you want because we have all the next stations and on board we have a team of six scientists two oceanological engineers two biological engineers and we do about 50 protocols covering all the range of uh, I mean a lot of things we added to meta transcriptomic the meta uh, proteomics the metabolomics meta metabolomics in fact we are doing a lot of measures of pollutants about a thousand a thousand pollutants, uh, by, um, organic pollutants. <coughs> um, and um, so it's, I, it's a very, very complete program. And then at, at the super sites, and Barcelona is a super site, AMBL brought also this amazing, you know, uh, advanced mobile lab where they have techniques to do cryomicroscopy, single cell, uh, you know, uh, identification. And, and uh, I think uh, Detlev is going to speak about that, really to work at the cellular and subcellular levels in addition to the, to the community level that we are doing in Tara. <coughs> and so basically, uh, we have finished the first year, 2003. Uh, we, have, we are eight months of expedition. There has been 65 uh, land sea transects sites sampled, 99 uh, Tara Ocean sites sampled, Tara Europa, sorry. Uh, we have already 33,000 sa uh, samples. You know, all these expeditions, they finish up between 50 and 100,000 samples, so which is then a lot of work, of course, to analyze all these samples. <coughs> and these, you, you are here until the end of July, the next, uh, the next stopover. <coughs> so I think what is really amazing about this expedition is that, conceptually, it really reaches and measures boundaries of planetary biology because it, analyze, it, is, it explores really end-member biomes, right? Ocean, soil, sediment, aerosols. These, these biomes are very different rhythm, right? In the plankton, the plankton, when you see the dynamics of, of the water, it's like the atmosphere, you know, it's atmospheric physics. It's the same for, for water fluidics. So we are really at, we're doing this exactly at this interface, I think, is really, really nice because in a short time, we'll have the end members of the, of the Earth system <coughs> complexity. We sample across by complexity scales, and we add to the metagenomics and the organismal part we did in Tarotian, these subcellular things, which is amazing because very often we don't know where those genes come from, and now we are going to do a lot of single cell genomics and, uh, and yes, working at this uh, organismal level. In fact, I think conceptually, cell may be the ultimate uh, you know, uh, object we should, we, should, we should think to for a new theory of evolution rather than organism. <coughs> uh, I think it will, also, it, it will for sure pro provide an amazing baseline and eventually allow to start disentangling fundamental drivers and principles of, of life, biocomplexification within and across biomes. So see what principles are common to biomes, what are different exchange of genes, exchange of species between these biomes that started diverging in the, <coughs> in the Proterozoic. 
technologically, the building of labs <coughs> with sails and on wheels, I think, is, is brilliant. Putting the same lab on sails and on wheels, develop these field modules to consistently measure life in context at both cellular and community levels. And also learning how to, to do all these protocols and logistic, logistic mess. You cannot imagine the difficulty of, of this part. <coughs> And uh, yeah, and in terms of data, um, <clears throat> I think we'll have we'll create here the most complete database integrating life in contextual biogeochemical and physical data in a mosaic of environmental condition encompassing past and, and and future condition of the Earth system. And this is so. The, of course, for the analysis of the data, I think we are going to hear more in the next talks. Two more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, just the future. In the future, we are, we are building this object. We'll put, we'll put an EMDA lab. Uh, uh, you know, uh, um, we'll move the, the mobile lab into this uh, Tara Polar Station. It, and it's free. It's, it's built. It will be built. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, currently built. It will be finished toward the end of the year. And this is going to be run until uh, 2040. <coughs> and uh, so I think there is one, one way to continue to explore, you know, the, the complexity. But we are, at some point, we are lost in complexity. I, I hope we will see some invariance coming out of the... Eric told me it's normal, you know, for, for cell behavior, they, they were lost for many years, and at some point they started to, to see some invariance that they could focus on. <laughs> the problem is that, yeah, the, the Earth system is huge, it's bigger than a cell, it's more dynamic, so I think we also need to find out very simple ways of measuring this complexity. We are also pushing a program that develops cheap instruments also for the southern country to create data that are compatible with what we do in Tara and Trek, but which can be made by, by, by a lot of people. So going through very simple instruments to get data in the dynamics of, of the Earth system. And we are very proud because we are able to convince the French Navy to create job of biodiversity officers. So we have, <laughs> we have currently um, <clears throat> 16 biodiversity officers and France, we are lucky because France is a very nice, you know, inter a very planetary country. We have all these uh, little islands everywhere. So we are starting a really, really cool measure in the dynamics of the, of the, of the world plankton. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Columban. Very nice. Um, we have time for one question. Okay. Hi, nice talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the track expedition if there is any measurement of the hydrodynamics. And I couldn't, you know, because to me it looks like the connection between land and sea, the hydrodynamics, the transport, is, is, is you know, currents. The, from, fresh, from fresh water to, to marine waters, you mean, or from uh, or in inside the inside the sea? I mean, it's yeah, important. No, they, I they mean, are, the, the snapshot yeah. of what you get yeah. in a point it depends of if the current goes north, south, Absolutely. east, yeah. or west. No, these kind of things we are going to reconstruct after a while, you know. But of course, you know, these expeditions are really baseline, uh, where we will find very basic principles of, of organization of life. Then, for the dynamics, I mean, we hope that. It, it will create also the, 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 the need to, to study this more because you have all these marine stations you know, that, that can then take over. But uh, we have a very good team of physicists that can reconstruct the transit time between stations after a while. Yeah. Hi, Columban. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Very yeah. nice. I'm curious to know which are the transects that you chose here in Barcelona. Which transect? Which one? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Or maybe, <laughs> maybe I think Ramiro chose, has chosen them. <laughs> no, I think we. <laughs> but we have in Blanes, of course. Yeah, we, we have, we have Blanes, Blanes, two stations in Blanes, the I hope. Series, yeah. uh, in Blanes, uh, the Besos, and Stardit as well, because all the work being done. So these are the three, the three places. Starting from? Uh, it's starting uh, in Besos, then goes to Blanes, and then Stardit. No, you mean? Where, where, where land is ah, the land, the land was a yeah. The where in? Inland. Inland. Ah, uh, how many meters inland? You mean or? Yeah. The first sample in, in land, it's on a on an industrial polygon or something. <laughs> it's exactly no no. Uh, it's uh, I mean it's places that 
you have access to make a transect and then you can get in, you know, walking there and, and it's on the beach. Uh, it has to be a pollute place, for example, but not uh, an accessible. So Blanes is a little bit steep and the Desembocadura del Besos, which is the mouth river of Besos, it seems to be accessible. So, yes. One is urban and Exactly. One is pristine, the other is uh, contaminated. Okay, thanks a lot, Coleman. Yeah. Okay. So our next ex speaker is uh, Pep Garçol from the house. Uh, I guess most of you know Pep already. And he will tell us, uh, well, his title is Microbes, Sentinels of Planetary Health. Okay, thanks uh, for being here. Um, Ramiro asked me to give a talk, I didn't want to. So then I had to make the title, so I made the title because I thought what I was going to talk about. So, but I thought that th this was a kind of a nice idea and I tried to defend that. I'm trying to defend that the microbes are the sentinels of planet Earth. And, uh, how does this work? Okay, well first thing you know that microbes are, have a large contribution to the whole of the Earth, biomass. I mean, they are here, bacteria, this is like bacteria, archaea, protist, sorry, Coloman, uh, fungi, and, and uh, mammals. Mammals, actually, if you wonder, we are here. So a tiny little thing that makes a lot of mess. Microbes are very important on, on the Earth. They are very important in the ocean. In the ocean, they are, you are much more relevant. I, I see, you are happy, right? Okay, but still, bacteria, bacteria, protists, viruses, everything together is a large part of Earth. It's the yellow part here. So it's not only that. I mean, they have a fast growth. Growth is related to the maximum rate of growth of an individual is inversely related to size. So if you go to the size of the prokaryotes, for example, you have that they can turn over 10 times a day or 20 or even more than that. So they respond fast. And they evolve fast. You all remember this story about the, the COVID virus, how in May 20, uh, 2020 we had one type of COVID virus in October, we had like two, the Delta one. In March the next year, we had another one, the Kappa. And in August, we had another one. So they were evolving like hell. And you all know the experiment that uh, Richard Lemsky has been doing during 10,000 generations of uh, bacteria. And you know that during these 20 years of experiment, the genome size of these organisms has decreased. There's been m many more other things that have changed. So microbes actually respond and evolve in the time life of a scientist. A scientist that has a permanent position, of course. <laughs> and uh, not only that, I mean, they are, <laughs> they are engines, sorry. <laughs> they are the engines, the genes uh, behind biogeochemical cycles, all these uh, exchanges of carbon that we have, and uh, the use of oxygen, and the fixation of nitrogen, and all sorts of these metabolisms here are mostly done by microbes. And as you showed before, I mean, all these things that we can see from space and the land constructions or the geology of the land, it's actually due to the microbes being active. Not only that, they are sensors. I mean, they, they actually respond to, for example, as a small change in CO2, we have like bacteria respond by enhancing expression of genes encoding proton pumps, such as this and that and that. And they do it only if they have en enough energy to do it, because if they don't have enough energy, they cannot do it. So they are actually modifying the, uh, the, the, uh, the economy of the whole ecosystem. And they, they, this change, this detection of change by the microbes, actually can happen in just a few years. So look at here, with this change in temperature in the Bay of Biscay, how the number of cells, the bacterial abundance, and their size, where is the size, has been clearly changing. And the same happens in the Arctic in just four years in a change in the size of the phytoplankton. So they are abundant, they are fast growing, they are fast evolving, they affect biogeochemical cycle, and they react, react 
fast to change. So they are fantastic sentinels of the health. The same way that my, most uh, people in medicine, they say that the microbes are sentinels, those that are telling us what happens to our health, we can say that the, the microbes are the sentinels of ecosystem health, the sentinels of ocean health, and planetary health, of course, but I'm not going to talk beyond the, 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 the ocean. In addition, they are very relevant in uh, blue biotechnology by product, producing biomass, bio, uh, policy, polysaccharide compounds, antibiotics, biosynthetic enzymes. You can uh, get uh, tools for editing genomes from the ocean, and you can use them for bioremediation. In fact, there's this nice paper by the people in Terra Ocean in which they found, they reconstructed 25,000 mugs, most of them from Tara, but a few, a few ones from Malaspina. I'm happy to say that. And, um, and they found that there was a bunch of bacteria which you have never heard of called Eremiobacteria, the group, uh, the candidatus Eudoremio, whatever, that they have lots of biosynthetic gene clusters, which we don't know very much what they are used for, but they are synthesizing compounds. Uh, there was one of them that's called, that they call it Candidatus Eudero, whatever, Malaspini. There is a, there is a Tara Oceani, Oceani one, too. But this one is more than 6% of uh, particle attached batipelagic communities in the Malaspina expedition. So it's a very relevant organism that's down there, that it uh, has the potential for many things, but we don't know which ones are. The same, uh, we are now working, Pablo and Sylvia, they are working in, in getting uh, CRISPR-Cas9 systems from the metagenomes, and they are finding two types, the, uh, one is hysterics, the other is obelix, two types that seem to be important or that could be used in, in, in biotechnology. So I thought, hey, microbes, they are the night, what, I mean, El Sereno. I mean, most of you were not born when there used to be serenos in the, in the towns, but, but uh, uh, that's the translation, night watch person. Eh? And, and, but they, they do know what's going on everywhere. They have the keys, and they have tools to defend, and they are the ones that we should be interrogating to know what is going on down there in the ocean. So let's go and let's interrogate the, uh, the serenos, the, 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 the watch persons of the ocean. And while we do that, I think that the next steps should go in the following directions. And this is just my opinion. The first one is that we should go to the fourth dimension. And uh, Colomban already mentioned that a little bit. I mean, these high throughput sequencing, large expeditions or, or, or samplings like ICOM, Tara Oceans, Malaspina, Geotraces, ocean sampling, they were sampling one side across the space. However, and this is what they obtained, for example, Tara Ocean and Malaspina, all sorts of samples for which uh, 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 Tara Oceans obtained 40 million non-redundant genes, 47 million non-redundant genes in the second edition, 1.12 billion non-redundant genes, this 17, so many genes all over the place. But this is just special. That's what Tara Ocean was giving us, Tara Arctic was giving us spatial resolution, Tara Pacific the same, the Mission Microbiome, the same story. Trek is doing the same, but oh boy, we go to the time. That's the next step, I think. It's the next step because there are already stations that are, have been sampling for tens of years, that they have metagenomic or genomic data sets. And they respond to the same, sorry because the graph is not very nice, but this is a comparison between all these stations. And you can see that there is a change in diversity which seems very similar in all of them, except in this one, because it's in the other, uh, in the other part of the planet, so it should be, uh, it, it, uh, it has the winter at the, in the middle and not at the top. So there's something going on that happens everywhere. But we can only understand that if we sample for many years. I have this nice graph that one of our students, Ona, gave, uh, sent us a couple of days ago. And, and you can see this is from 2004 to 2014, and this is uh, the number of species that are growing in, in a fast, fast burst, so that they were growing a lot from one day of sampling to the next day. And you can see it's more or less the same all, all the time, right? Look at what happens here. Abs Opa. <laughs> Sorry, the surprise. <laughs> Look at this thing here, completely different. 
And what happened here? Oh, that they had the harbor of blindness actually changed. And this was our sampling site. So instead of looking at the satellites or going there to visit, we could have looked at the bacteria and understand that there was something very serious going on in this place that day. We can also look at long-term changes in community structure. This is for phytoplankton and uh, also in, Blan in Blanus Bay. And you can see that there is a change in cryptophytes that are decreasing, diatoms decreasing, dinoflagellates decreasing, prochlorococcus not that much, cynecococcus decreasing, very significant during time. And not only that, we can look at evolution within the, the, the community. And this is work by the, the Lock Lab, Ramiro's uh, laboratory, in which they look at, the, at some uh, genomic species and they look at the mutations in these genomic um, species and they find, they compared actually Banyuls with Barcelona, or Blanes, sorry, and they found that there were genes, genes that were adaptive, adaptive that some were, were changing with time in uh, Blanes Bay, others were changing in both places, and so on and so on. So there's, there's genetic, genetic change in the time span of the senior scientists. And um, so that's the first point, 4D. Second, shorter space and time scales, oh please. We are sampling, this is a, a sampling at the scale of, a, of, a, of group, large groups. But then when you go to the species, look at what happens. And to do that, we have to sample every day, or even often than very every day. So that's, that's the next frontier. If the growth rate of the microbes is fast, then our sampling intervals should be fast as well. And for that, we need maybe strategies like uh, false cytometries that you can have in the ocean or near the ocean, and you can then have the evolution of different groups of plankton at every minute or every tens of minutes or something like that. We're working on that. Massimo's working on automatic frequent measurements of microbial abundance, relative activity, and phenotypic diversity with this tool that he puts together, his game. And, uh, and Kip can measure a sample every 15 minutes and about 1,200 samples for a normal one-week cruise. And you can go to Antarctica and see how bacterial abundance is changing online, and you can see also the phenotypic diversity, how it's changing, and you have areas with large diversity and areas with lower diversity. In fact, diversity was correlated with salinity in this case, except for a few stations here. We did that in the Mediterranean with uh, our beloved Garcia Cid, which is going to retire soon if he hasn't done it too. And we could see that in these stations between Barcelona and Mallorca, we had real changes in abundance of bacteria and real changes in the diversity of bacteria. So we could go there and check that. These changes in the diversity of bacteria were related to water masses and things like that. So we have to go to that approach. The third point, contemplate the microstructure. And this is an image that Teresa and the people in the, in the advanced mobile lab have produced of a particle, in this case is a fecal pellet of a copy pot, and it has a structure, it has organisms there, some one, probably different types of, of organisms, is, they are checking that. The idea is that sometimes we think that plankton is this, because we have to sample one liter, or two, or 10, or 20, and filter them. So we lose any, rel any information that might happen at the scale of the microbes, which is something like that. This is an artistic depiction by Farouk Azam in which bacteria are not free living there. Bacteria are in a, in a wall that's actually complex, that has a structure, that they associate to each other, and Tara Oceans also did many studies of association. So even those that work, we work in the plankton, we should look at that. Next step, single cell analysis. We have to create a catalog of single cell genomics of plankton in our environment. And uh, some people have started to do that, but it's still a very, very far away thing. We have to put resources into that. We have to create this catalog. And my last, last point, we have to couple biogeochemical fluxes to genomes and organisms. How we do, do we do that? meta transcriptomics, and I think Maria is going to talk, talk about uh, that soon. But we have all sorts of photosynthesis, carbon fixation, all sorts sort of um, biogeochemical cycles that change during the day and different organisms do one thing at one time of the, the day and others at another times of the day. And we have to learn that and appreciate that. How we do, can do that? Well, maybe we can resort 
to these environmental sample processors so if you, that should be put in different areas in the, in the coast of Europe and we should pro process that. If you have plenty of money, you don't know how to do, equip all those laboratories with the environmental sample processors because we scientists will make real nice use of that. Concluding, microbes are abundant, they grow fast, they evolve fast, and they are re reacting fast to environmental change. They are also very relevant in biogeochemical cycle, and they are probably a not yet well exploited uh, source for biotechnological uh, uh, products. In my plea, and I try to convince you in these 10 minutes, that we should go for long-term monitoring at well-known known sites, sites, so 4D. Short, special, and temporal scales, because we are not doing that. Coupling omics with geochemic, biogeochemical right measurements, because very often this is too complicated and we don't do it. Developing technology for in situ microbial diversity and function determinations, increasing single, single cell and population level studies, considering the micro scale and the spatial architecture of plankton. This should be, my opinion, our goal in the next future. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Pep. Really good. Um, we have some minutes for questions. Okay. Thanks, Pep. Very nice talk. What happened in these two years in Blanes? What is this uh, change in, uh, in this uh, diversity? They built a harbor. Okay. They create, I mean, they, they make the harbor larger. And apparently the first years especially, they, they really, uh, uh, the water became very turbid. And at the coast, this was very obvious. They have measurements of the, of the Posidonia, um, places where the Posidonia grows. That was very, they had no light. And, but in our case, our, our CTD that was measuring transparency didn't detect, detect any change. Yeah, because the transparency is, is very high these years too. Yeah, there's no, there's no difference, no real difference. But our colleagues from Blanes were measuring transparency closer, closer to the harbor and they said, we don't know what, what was the change. The change, we already observed this change in the, in the eukaryotes and we believed it was mistakes of sequencing. Now we have them also in the, in the prokaryotes. So, yeah. And they are very easy because this is not direct data, this is that, that the rate of change of one specific organism from sampling date to sampling date, that's what I showed you, and uh, you could see that there was, this was very uh, obvious. Thank so. you. Yeah. We are re-sequencing re, re the samples too, just in case. <laughs> I'm just wondering if, if so you are saying we should go single cell biogeochemistry, right? Well, I didn't say that, but it would be nice to. I, I, what so, I was saying well, is we should, we should create a single cell genomics catalog. So we should right. have, for our pet site in Blanes, we should, have, we should have, have thousands of single cell genomes. And the same should be done in all the long-term uh, stations. But when you are and thinking on linking to the biogeochemical cycles, it's on functional No, genes? that's, I mean, I, I think that we should, we should measure, I mean, we measure primary production, material production, all these things, but we should measure the rates of uh, nitrate transformation, the rates of nitrate production, the rates of phosphorus uptake, the rates, I mean, all these rates which are usually not measured because it takes too much time and it's too busy and the students don't want to do it because it's not fancy and they will not get a paper into a high you know, ranking journal and so on. So on. So we had discussed about that. <laughs> I have a quick question because I, I really like this uh, harbor story. I mean, it's been around for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. It was like a quarter millennium sometime. Yeah. <laughs> but now it seems that it's probably real. But what we see in practice is that it's really the community is totally I mean, extremely changed, and the signal we see is proteins that usually are not there. At yeah, the during time. the rest of the year. Yeah, so know. we were really puzzled. I mean, we thought it was a mistake, but then uh, 
So coming back to the question is, is there any other evidence, for example, like satellite evidence or any other evidence that could say that this is a real change happening? The no, uh, the only evidence we have is from the people in Blanes that were studying the Posidonia, how do you say that, where the, Bedro no, meadows, the Posidonia meadows at the, really close to the, to the place. And they did detect the changes and they, uh, they measured the recovery of the, of the of the Posidonia and so on and so on and so on. And when we ask them, they say, no, we, we detect the changes in light regime and so on and so on. So. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any other question? Okay, so let's thank Pep for the talk. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so our next speaker is uh, Arendt Detlev. I hope I pronounce well your, your name, from Embel in Heidelberg. And the title of his talk is Planetary Biology Across Scales, Correlating Cellular Variation in Selected Model Species with Environmental Gradients. Here we are. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, my name is Detlef Arendt. I'm from the EMBL in Heidelberg and co-chair of the Planetary Biology Transfer the Theme at, at EMBL. Um, I like a lot what, what my um, previous speakers said in terms of where planetary biology is going, especially as what, what um, Pep just said about um, the urgency of, in a way, transforming current environmental research in a way that we um, get a much broader picture at both spatial and temporal scales. Um, so what, it, what research at EMBL a few years ago in a way um, committed to was to move um, research to the planetary scale and to enable what we call a mechanistic understanding of life in its natural context. And um, so for this maybe as a, as a short note, life sciences have very long ignored the environment because they had to. We had to just shut it off from the environment because otherwise nothing would have been reproducible. We are now entering a time where we can do the opposite. And we have to because at the end life happens in context. So we now embrace and also the molecular life sciences have to embrace changing environments, genetic variation, diversity to understand it. And we can do so because we are, we are experiencing a technical revolution at, at many fronts. So there is the multi-omics, multi-modal, multi-omics, they allow unprecedented data collection at this range that is needed now. We have um, all sorts of new imaging modalities, such as also feedback microscopy, and we can go down across all scales from satellite imagery, imagery to down to electron microscopy, and I, I'll try to, to bridge this a little bit in my presentation. And what I think is, was completely correct, what, what Pep just said, is that we need to sample to an unprecedented extent and also in an automated manner, and we need feedback with, with AI models that, that are perfectly suited for the task that we have in hand to, um, to, to score um, environmental change. So we, knew, we need, and I think this is a very strong message, the, the future of environmental research will embrace we'll have to embrace AI models for ecology, micro and macro evolution because these are the most data rich and parameter rich um, disciplines that we can think of and, and we have these multi-dimensional spaces that we cannot understand just so and where we, where, um, in a way we need expanded um, yeah, stat multivariate statistics to make sense of, of life in its context. Um, so planetary biology focuses on all scales as um, my, um, speakers already said, from molecules to cells, organisms and communities. And this means also that's not only the spatial scale but also the temporal scale. That means um, it is from the direct reaction of, of organisms via acclimation in milliseconds even, and, and this is for example in animals the nervous system, to adaptation that happens in microevolution, as we all experience with COVID as you rightly said, to um, speciation and earth ages. So at the end, planetary scale ages. And um, it also involves field work and experimental science that is very clear to generate these, these multivariate data sets. Um, we do expeditions as well as bring the lab 
um, under controlled conditions into experimental systems such as mesocosms in the lab. And one example that we are here for today is a track expedition. I won't give any detail here, it has all been said. I will focus on one, um, with our planetary biology approach, on one aspect of this expedition that is illustrated here. So we are not only sampling microbes, we also sample um, multiple, what we call, selected model species. These are organisms that have been selected specifically for their occurrence along the European coastline, that we can sample them in as many sites and spots as possible. And um, this ranges from um, terrestrial organisms over via sponges, annelids, cnidarians, um, that we collect then in the, in the intertidal and subtidal zone. So this is just a, a survey of example projects for these selected model species. I will explain today um, our research on annelids, where we are looking for hotspots of cellular variation. This is also something that, that Pep just said. If you want to understand how, how life re reacts and responds to environmental change, at the end we also have to understand the molecular and cellular details. So what is really happening in these organisms when they um, respond to environmental change? Um, but we also have projects um, on bioacoustics, as I think Paula mentioned this morning. We, um, there, is, there are teams uh, sampling kelp forest, seagrass, yeah, where we look at the root rhizome microbiome, lucinate clams, um, to understand the seagrass holobiont. There is a project on animal algae symbiosis to, to study symbiosis with dinoflagellates in sea anemones. And, and I come to that briefly, we also sample intertidal annelid diversity. Now, what is this annelid I'm talking about today? That is um, a, a species that lives on macroalgae along the coastline. It, is, it lives in tubes, self-spun mucus tubes. It, is, it has a very rich behavior, actually. So what we are especially also monitoring is its nervous system. So this is a very early developmental stage, only three days old in this case, where the, developmental, where the nervous system is already fully developed and the head is full of sensory organs to respond to the environment. And um, so with this species, we can study acclimation timeframes um, down to adaptation timeframes that, so we are both interested in microevolution as well as um, the adaptation to different earth ages, because this is at the end a species that has existed in a very similar form since the early Cambrium. So there are fossils from 500, 2 million years ago that, that look very much alike. Um, and Platinum is as well suited for this expedition as um, we are talking exactly about this species here, which is Platinereus dumerili sensu strictu. The black one is found from Norway um, to Greece. This is from a, from a recently published study on the Platinereus species complex. This is not our work, it's from Teixeira et al. 2023. Um, it's a great study showing, exemplifying actually for this Platinereus species complex where the different subspecies are found. So this is extremely interesting as we can monitor everything from one species adapting with its population to the whole of the European coast down to subspecies that are sometimes geographically more separated and so on. Okay, and what, what do we study there? Um, first of all, we have to always, um, of course, find out what we are working with. And this is that on, on the, uh, mo in the advanced mobile laboratory from this summer onwards, we will be directly able um, to, to sequence on site to know, to know what we are studying. This is an Oxford nanopore system, and we are also having a new colorimetric test um, to directly sample or to direct genotype our specimen. Um, this is the species of interest. Again, the six-day-old platinary is young worm. This is a planktonic phase that is about to settle. It only, it's a worm with only three segments, but it has a lot of morphology already on board. And this is the resources we can build on. So when we sample this organism, um, we are indeed going into cellular and molecular detail. And this is what I'm showing you here for this organism, we have an atlas, the multimodal Platy browser, which is a wall in the M volume, electron microscopy volume, that covers the entire organism of about 12,000 cells and integrates it with cellular expression data. So for every cell in the body, we also have a good knowledge of the, in the atlas of about 150 genes that it expresses so that we have an expression profile for every cell in the body. And so it is a combination of ultrastructure and gene expression that we can use that we can now use to address the question, how, do, how does not only the whole organism, but how does every cell 
and in a way every molecule um, and expressed gene respond to the environmental change. This is um, a word now to the ultrastructure. This has not been used yet to understand um, environmental adaptation, but what we can, can do here is to use AI to take all the segmented cells of the body. So this here, the computer has recognized the cells in the body. Here, the nuclei in the body. So we have a morphological data set for each of them. And then we can use unsupervised learning out of these um, ultrastructural data to reduce the um, high dimensional space down to a feature vector of only about 140 um, parameters that are now enough to give um, a complete morphological description of the cells. If, you, if the computer has this vector, which, which is just 100, 140 digits, it can reconstruct the entire cell at the ultrastructure level. So it can give the information back. It is in. So everything is so highly correlated, and AI is able to recognize this, that we can um, reduce down the complexity of an entire electron optic resolution cell into one vector. And of course, this is a, a fantastic means in the future to also study the morphological variation, for example, in exposure to the environment. That means we can generate data sets now where the cells morphologically modify, and then we can use our vector just as we can use expression vectors with single cells, um, ex with genes expressed in single cells to study variation. Um, here are, for example, cells that are very similar in, in morphological space. We call this morpho features, and you see that they have very similar forms. Um, and the future, in a way, this is still science fiction, but this is where we are trying to go, is to bring um, these morpho features describing cells in all their morphological complexity, ultrastructure, um, to score the variation here and compare it to um, gene expression variations so or to the genotype which we, which we get with single cell sequencing and this way then understand the genotype phenotype interface um, at the cellular level in, in, the, in the environmental vector, in the environmental dimension if you want. So this, this is the uh, multimodal platy browser where we can in a way score every cell for morphological variation but then also for expression variation. Here is some expression depicted into the, into the Platy browser. And what we are doing is that we generate um, single cell expression data for, this is here, here now for the lab culture, but we are doing it as well for animals sampled from the environment along the track European coastline. And then, um, when, and this, this is then how they cluster. Many of you have probably seen this before, when cells, every dot represents a cell, um, and when two dots are very close, they have a, a similar expression profile. And so this, this we can do for the lab culture, but also for the worms that we now sample uh, with track from the environment and see how this changes. And I will, I will show you some prelimi preliminary results. So this is the Platy browser, the Atlas, that exists for Platin Race to Merili, Sensu Strictu. And this is all the multimodal data that can be mapped, for example, the morpho features in the morpho feature space, our, we have mapped our single cell expression so that for all of these cell types here in the body, we know the um, ten thousands of genes that are usually on. Um, we can also do this in the field with population single nuclei and SkySeq is a new technique that allows us to ex just expand data-wise um, enormously. We can sequence the worms. We can score variation, gen genomic variation. This has been, of course, all been done before, but now we can do it with worm sequence then. And then if there is a gene catalog of, of variant genes from a specific site, we can directly map them into the atlas and for example and see, yeah, for example, it's the foregut or it's the brain where all of this expression vari vari variation finds its focus. And then we can do targeted subvolumes of structures of interest and see the morphological variation and then also determine the morpho features to bring this all together. So this is the the uh, research concept, the framework that we're we operating in. This is sampling the worms in Kiel in Germany last year. This is what happens these days. Also, um, I think we are, we are operating from Estatit, close to Barcelona. And um, this is, for example, the sampling afternoon last, last year in summer. This is now what, what we will take these worms and directly score their genotype with um, the Oxford Nanopore system that we have on board. Um, and what we do then with the worms is that we take heads and trunk, freeze them. Um, so these are the sexually immature atoc adults from different habitats. 
we establish a species identity, and then, for example, we can take the heads, process heads for single nuclei capture, and um, then downstream determine cell type specific allele usage in the, in the specific cells, cell type abundance, yeah? for example, taking the heads, um, sequencing the individual nuclei of the heads, putting them in a single in a cell single cell U map as we do it here, and then determine expression variation. Um, what we this is microevolution. We are also during the expedition doing this in a more in more expanded time scale on uh, macroevolution, in that we do intertidal analyte sampling for all of these species. We we sample trunk and and also the head. We do um, brain single cell sequencing, and then can also determine. Um, a, a, across a, a longer time range, broader time range, over hundreds of millions, even that these species are apart, how cell type genetic usage has changed, for example, in the brain. And this, this way we can determine which cell types in the brain are the ones um, prone to change. This is just uh, for you an image of, of analyte brain diversity that we are addressing. Um, we, are, we are also interested in the platinum microbiome, one part, and this is in collaboration with Per Borg, is to look at the gut microbiome of these animals and then also compare this along the coastline, but also to compare this to the huge microbial data sets that we have from all the other sources, yeah, from the plankton, bacterial, also, also um, protists, and, and see how this correlates. And here I come back to my AI message. We will not be able to, to see this unless we, we create huge AI models that at the end will tell us how everything interacts and, and correlates. So the, the last thing we are doing with the worms is that we sample sexually mature adults and produce batches so that we get these six-day-old young worms that I showed you before during the expedition. And this is what it looks like. And this was one of the pioneer expeditions in Christineberg. If you ever um, put a put a light into, at, at midnight, around midnight, into the dark water at a spot where, at a coastal spot, in many instances you will actually see platinum rays coming to the surface, swimming around. This is an ex ex especially rich event, but this is then simply what we catch, put into vessels, and you see this image from, this movie from last year, Yvonne was also present when we were doing this in Bilbao. This is now a batch that could as well be in the lab, so this is platinum rays spawning. We, um, sample them the batch, we put it into the incubator for six days, and then we get the, and then do the single cell sequencing, which is technically identical to what the normal single cell sequencing in the lab. So what you can do if you do this, this is the object I told you, I, so, I showed you from the Heidelberg culture. These are new single cell objects from six days old worms, for example, from Villefranche or from Christineberg and what we are generating currently. Um, we can then look compare these objects and cell type by cell type and, and see how they change in the abundancy. Yeah, just to give you one example, um, here is a cell type that is completely absent in Villefranche. Here's one that is enriched in Villefranche. The one that is enriched in Villefranche, cell type 20, are in fact the multi-ciliated cells, these ones here, that these larvae used to swim in the water. So somehow this is a cell type that has increased in abundance in the, in the water, just to show you that we can make now with the cellular um, molecular resolution, we can make sense of, of these data. And um, here is a cell type 48 that I'm showing you because this is a very interesting one. It represents the mushroom body, the, if you want, the, the associative sensory um, organ of the brain that analytes have, just like insects. So these mushroom bodies are represented in this cell type here. Um, and these are all the genes specific for the cell type. This is, first of all, an interesting finding to understand these mushroom bodies, but now we want to know how do these genes change um, in response to the environment. And here we have the transcription factor that's are passed on this list are these two here, for example. They, they define the mushroom bodies. And now what is remarkable is that looking at the, cell, at the um, single cell variation between Villefranche and Christineberg and looking for differential gene expression in my, mushroom body cell type 48, we found one of the two transcription factors, PDF1, in two paralox, and differentially it's enriched in Villefranche versus Christineberg. So what we, what we learn is that in, at the one spot, we, they use another transcription factor than in the other, and of course it will be very interesting to see what is downstream.
Good, I'm done. Um, these are the two genes in the mushroom bodies. And what I want to emphasize at the very end is that all of this is only possible because there is a huge team, the track team, which are hundreds of people. The sampling, the, the um, track team at Emble for mobile services, planetary biology, but also many people who help the SIPI team doing the, the public outreach, the scientific sampling team that, that you see some faces here, there are even more. But I think all of this is only possible with this huge effort that ma many people come together and do this and that we also are so nicely hosted and cooperate at, this, at the stations like, like this ones where we come to and then have, have the scientific interaction here. So thanks a lot for listening. No, I don't know. Sí, sí, sí. Estaba apagado. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Now I understand why uh, you wanted to sample platinum arrays. Uh, at, the, at our site, I think is uh, the sampling is during this this week. So I wonder, uh, do you know? I mean, the distribution of these species is uh, we will find it here. You know the the, the distribution. I mean, I, I saw that you found it in. Uh, Bill Frank, so I'm assuming that the rest But Newell said it has also been found. For Barcelona itself, we, we don't know, we just assume by, by proximity. Well, not in Barcelona, yeah. uh, north. At, no, uh, yeah, north yeah. Barcelona, at, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, okay. And can it be, uh, be easily confused with other species? Well, very easily. As I said, there are, there are some, some sp species that are even um, known for a completely different reproduction mode, like Platinum Masayensis, which has been described in Marseille first, but for example, exists in Banyuls, as we know. Um, this is Platinum Masayensis, which is morphologically completely the same. You will not be able to distinguish these. People okay. have for a long time denied that it's two species, but they are genotypically different. And, and for this purpose, we now bring on board the Oxford Nanopore system that we can directly genotype on site. Okay. Yeah, oh, and people okay. in my lab have also mm. developed a, a calorimetric test, and that will be interesting for other people too, where we just, it is also a COVID um, yeah. uh, fallout, in fact, that this test was developed for, for testing for the virus, and we can now use the same technique to test for the specimen, that, or for the species that we have, and we can distinguish, for example, Masaliensis and Dume really easy. Exactly. And then bioacoustics? Why do you, what are you doing with the bioacoustics? Bioacoustics, this... Um, is a system that allows you to, just by listening into the water, so it's passive bioacoustics, where there's no sound um, emitted, it's just listening. And um, Lucia Diorio, who does this, and with her team, they use this data to learn especially about fish diversity, because they are making a lot of noise, but also crustacean diversity. And then a, a big list of, of other unknown players that generate sound and um, populate the ocean. Sometimes it's difficult to de-orphanize, so where is this exactly coming from? But I, as, as far as I know, they are quite experienced in doing this and, and can learn a lot from just listening into the water. There's, if there is no environmental noise overcasting everything, then this is a very rich resource of information. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we need to move to the next speaker. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Maria Villacosta from the IDAEA CSIC, and she, uh, the title of her talk is Plastic, Pollutants and Marine Bacteria, a Biochemical Perspective. And she just got a new t-shirt, apparently. Brand new. L. Oh, super. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ramiro, for the invitation to give this talk today. I would like to actually start the talk asking you a question. What do you think there is in common between this Gore-Tex jacket I'm wearing right now, these seats where you are sitting, or the fire extinctors of the room, or all these projects, all these products that you see on the screen? What do you think they have in common? Anyone? 
is brave enough to answer? Contaminant, right, <laughs> correct. They all contain organic pollutants that are persistent enough to be found in our oceans. There are hundreds of them. For instance, this family of emerging pollutants uh, called the PFAS, the perfluorochemical substances that they are components of the Teflon, so they make these Gore-Tex jackets, these mountain equipments that we all wear when we go to the mountains, or these pants that they anti adherent right? They are known as forever chemicals. Or another family of emerging pollutants, organophosphor esters, flame retardants, that are like components of, for instance, this seat here. Or historical pollutants, the production of them has been forbidden in the last 50 years, but due to their persistency and bioaccumulation bio and toxicity, but still nowadays, as you can see here, they can be found everywhere in our oceans, like the PCBs or the HCBs or subcombustion products like the dioxins, the furans, the hydrocarbons, obviously the plastics, the nanoplastics, the microplastics, and all this complex mixture of organic pollutants, plus many, 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 many others, whoopa, many others that we don't have the analytical capacities to identify and quantify each of them. We are talking about thousands of different synthetic chemicals that they are components of our daily life products compose what we call the anthropogenic dissolved organic matter, the adoc. That like any other biogenic compound, they enter into the cycling of elements. As you can see here, this is a biogenic dissolved organic carbon produced by phytoplankton in green. These this organic pollutants, they are produced on land, they can reach our ocean through terrestrial inputs or through atmospheric deposition thanks to their semi-volatile nature. They can be deposited everywhere uh, in the ocean. That explains this, this widespread distribution we observe. And actually, got cycled through the microbial loop and then into the, into the food webs, into the marine food webs. However, there are some characteristics that makes this compound different from the biogenic ones. Besides this capacity of long-range transport, they are hydrophobic, bioaccumulative, so they have this tendency to, to get into the organic tissues, into the lipidic uh, tissues, so they actually bioaccumulate into the particles, into the organism, and many of them are toxic. So they pose threat to marine ecosystems. To illustrate that, it's been predicted that, remember that family I told you, the PCBs, the production of them, it's been forbidden for 50 years? It's, it's forecast that the bioaccumulation of PCBs nowadays in killer whales is going to explain the, 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 the collapse of this population by a half in the next 50 years just due to these PCBs bioaccumulating the organisms because they originate problems in the reproduction and in the immunological system. And, okay, you may ask yourself, okay, Maria is telling us we are all producing organic pollutants, they arrive into the ocean by atmospheric deposition, but how much is that? This is a large amount, this is an amount we should be concerned about it. Let me, let me illustrate with one example. This is one model family of this complex mixture of thousands of organic pollutants, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. They are also hydrophobic, bioaccumulative, toxic, carcinogenic, and so on. They are subproducts of the combustion of of organic matter, boot, uh, fossil fuels, tobacco, you know, they are products of the oil refineries and so on. And in this paper produced by my research group some years ago, you see that we can find pH in the oceanic atmosphere, in the dissolved phase of the water column, in the particulate phase. And the amount that it's estimated that it goes into our ocean by atmospheric deposition is one teragram a year or 400 if we take into account those hydrocarbons that we don't have, we cannot specifically identify them, but they share the same physical chemical properties. That amount equals every month to four times the, the pH released by the worst oil spill accident ever occurred in our oceans that you may remember. It was the deep horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Or in other words, the entrance of eight, uh, pH by atmospheric deposition equals like having 52 deep horizon spills accidents in our oceans year after year after year after year. 
it's, and it's, it's quite a large amount, right? And this is only one family of this complex mixture of organic pollutants. It's all bad news? Well, there are some good news. And I'm happy to tell you that we were able to quantify that up to 99% of this pH, they can be removed from the water column by, by microbial degradation. This is why it makes sense to study marine microorganisms when we study organic pollutants as well. However, even if I'm telling you that most of the pollution of our ocean is accounted by these thousands of, of organic pollutants, when you go to Google and you look for ocean pollution, what do you see? You see plastics, right? Plastics, 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 plastics everywhere. Because actually plastics is the superstar of ocean pollution. Uh, we will take Barry as our superstar of ocean pollution, but we should ask them ourselves, what's plastic actually? What's the composition of plastics? Plastics are mostly polymers and a smaller proportion of additive. These substances that they add to the plastics to give them the flexibility, the viscosity, the resistance, and so on, right? But however, look at this. Even if the pollute, when we look at the, at the polymers, we have only six different types. The big six, the Americans love to put these names, right? The big six are the polymers. However, the additive, if been quantified to be more than 10,000 substances, more than 2,000 of them, potentially toxic. And if I tell you many, many thousands of substances, synthetic substances, it sounds familiar to the anthropogenic dissolved organic carbon because they are part of them. So plastics, they are a source of these other compounds, but at the same time, plastics also have the capacity to absorb these pollutants onto the walls. Not only the microplastics, also the nanoplastics. So actual, the, actually, the plastic leachate is just a, actually it's a mixture of these plastic fragments. You know, this is when the plastics reach the ocean, they get fragmented, we all know that, right? They undergo, they undergo uh, physical fragmentation, photodegradation, and so on, until they reach to be microplastics and nanoplastics, but when they are here, they are not only leaking other compounds, they are also sorbing part of these other compounds, and they are also leaking plastic dock. In this slide provided by Cristina uh, Romera Castillo, that is a doctor that she works here in marine science, it's been estimated that every year, more than 23,000 tons of dock is leached from plastics every year into the oceans, and it's probably more. So it's quite a large amount. So what happens if we study how is the interaction between these plastic leachates and the marine bacteria? And when I mean marine bacteria, I refer to the heterotrophic fraction, those that respire, and the phototrophic fraction, those that they do the photosynthesis. So in recent papers, they found that this plastic leachate actually increases the bacterial activity while they have a negative effect on the photosynthesis carried out by the photos by the phototrophic bacteria. These are Synecococcus and Prochorococcus. And we were actually very happy to see that because we've been accumulating experiments, exposure experiments, in the last 10 years in my research group, exposing marine microbial communities into different families of these organic pollutants, not only adult mix, also PH, OPE, PFOS, and many others. And just in an overview, we already reached the same conclusion the other compounds increase the bacterial activity and decrease the photosynthesis of marine microorganisms. And there is more to study. When we got in touch with the Trek people, they asked us, okay, it would be very nice to include one of families of these organic pollutants, which one do you want to study? And we pick the OPEs, flame retardant and plasticizers. These are these components of the of the of many products and they are they have been increasingly used because the brominate ones that that were the ones that they were used before they were too toxic to be produced anymore so now they are keep increasing the production of the OPEs uh, flame retardant and plasticizers that they are still toxic they have neurotoxic effects cancerogenic and so on but not so much as the brominate ones and you can find them in in all our oceans, we, we have contributed to quantify their presence into the oceans. We actually have done experiments to see if actually microbial um, communities are able to degrade them 
And actually, in one experiment done here in July in Blanis, using Blanis, when the seawater is limited by phosphorus, and here you can see the different components of this family of organic pollutants and the different concentrations in the controls when, where we didn't add OPEs, or in the experiment where we add OPEs, this is initial time point, final time point, the concentrations decrease after only 24 hours. So we observe that actually my, marine microorganisms can degrade these compounds, but mainly under, under limiting conditions. So it's not a preferred source. Also, we've been studying the, these compounds in the open oceans, doing experiments, quantifying turnover rates, and seeing how is this latitudinal, latitudinal variation of the, of the consumption. And here you can see people that is now working in marine science, like Berta or Gemma Casas, uh, or Isa that is now doing the postdoc in our lab. And actually, the work of Isa is um, isolating bacterial strains that they have the capacity to degrade these compounds, these OPs. And we have actually bacteria that are candidates to use them as a, as a phosphorus source or as a carbon source. And we are doing something else besides having these bacteria. We are actually creating bioelectric ML systems, microbial electrochemical cells, where we are trying to enhance the removal of these pollutants while producing hydrogen by using these microbial, uh, these microorganisms that they've been isolated. And in collaboration with Michael Zimmerman in EMBOL, we are actually trying to figure out which genes are involved in the degradation of these compounds. And this is exactly what we want to do in, in, in TREC, because we've been studying open oceans, but we haven't studied the coastal system. So we are in charge of measuring the concentrations of these contaminants along the coastlines. How is the variation? Which bacteria? Um, seems to be involved uh, into the degradation of these compounds if there are genes that they are, that we can identify to see how is also the biogeography of these genes and so on. And that's what I wanted to explain to you. Thank you very much. This is my research group because obviously everything is always uh, teamwork. We have a Twitter account that I invite you to follow and a super, super active Instagram account. Uh, that it's uh, maintained by our PhD students, that they are super motivated. This is from the last uh, Antarctic project. Uh, they just came back two weeks ago, and they post videos and so and many, 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 many things, and it's really cool account to follow. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Maria. Um, questions? Anyone? Thank you. Aquí? A ver. Hi, Maria. Very nice talk. Um, you talk about the, um, the activity of bacteria, heterotrophic bacteria, in biodegradating these, uh, these uh, plastic substances. How much feasible is uh, the, um, the interaction of these bacteria in degrading these plastics? I mean, uh, they will make uh, a, big, a big difference or uh, you will need to do something else? For the plasticizers? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, expectedly they will degrade most of them, eventually. It's just that it takes a long time. But that uh, for pH is up to 99% for for the plasticizers, we don't know yet. We, I can tell you in one year, when we have all the samples, process, and so on. But um, there is a large variability. Sometimes, you know, they don't touch these OPEs. Sometimes they, they really degrade them, in, in the case, in the example of the OPE family, uh, only because they have nothing else. And it's actually really cool that they can get OPEs from atmospheric deposition, since many parts of the ocean are phosphorus limited, right? So. That opens the question, what if uh, marine bacteria that live in a phosphorus limited area, they get available phosphorus uh, by atmospheric deposition that is anthropogenic? Thank you. Probably they can use it, yeah. Hey, Maria, thanks. Very cool to see, finally, the full picture. Um, I was wondering, how much do you expect now uh, that you will get the samples from coastal areas? How much do you expect, or how much would you guess 
that the degradation or biodegradation of these different compounds depend on, for instance, temperature or different environmental factors or, you know, uh, even, I mean, is it really linked just directly to microbial communities composition and the amount of, of, of organisms that actually can degrade or it also depends strongly on other environmental factors? It depends on many environmental factors. As you say, temperature plays a role, the diversity of the community plays a role. We observe a decrease in diversity when we expose communities to these compounds, but we, ha we observe an increase of the potential degraders, but not always, only sometimes. And there is another factor that we didn't take into account at the beginning, which is the prehistory of the community to the exposure of these pollutants. So, those communities that they are used to live with these pollutants, they have a higher capacity to degrade them than others. And they also have more mobile genetic elements, and that makes the community much more um, sweet to cope against the toxicity of these compounds and able to degrade them. So there is a lot of variability because there are many factors. It's not only community composition. There is physical chemical parameters as well. Okay, yeah. one, one more, Columban. I was just wondering, uh, yeah, how can you discriminate between, I mean, do, do you know if those compounds exist also naturally in, in the systems? The plasticizers? I mean, or all know, of when them. You, so when you look, for instance, at the diversity of, uh, how do I like that? Yeah. Yeah, of cell cover, of, uh, of protists, you know, you have all sorts of polysaccharides. And so mm -hmm. how about, do we know if those, if those organic molecules so exist naturally at much less concentration, right? Because there are, I, I guess there are many, many more natural products than There are many, many more, yeah. but they have turnover rates much, much faster in many mm. cases. So the, 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 there are two points about this ad hoc pool of compounds. The first one is that we, we, we all have standards to quantify and, and, and mm. identify and quantify a very small proportion of them. So it's like mm. an iceberg. Mm. We, we can only identify the top of the iceberg. Mm. The main mm. composition of them, the main compounds that they compose this pool, mm. we don't know. We know mm. they are there, but we don't know. And, and okay, so it's possible that what you call anthropogenic exists already in nature, but at, most, at much less concentration. Because I think similar structures, but not the same compounds. Why? Not exactly the same compounds. But for instance, this is the, 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 OPs, the OPs are triesters. Triesters, you, you, you don't have triesters, but you have diesters. And you have monoesters. And now, for instance, the enzymes are very promiscuous between the diesterases and the triesterases. But there is no natural tree stresses that is being produced by phytoplankton, for instance. And the other point that oh, I wanted can to you say tell that you. So firmly. <laughs> see, see, I, 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 I tell you. <laughs> because I had the same question my, to myself. Because when you are looking for genes, you are looking for genes that degrade, you know, that chemical structure, not that compound, right? So you, you first look if there is three esters ester, or not, phosphorus three esters. And the other thing is that when you look at the concentrations, if you compare to the natural and the anthropogenic, is that these anthropogenic are orders of magnitude higher yeah. in the particles. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. What? I was thinking in terms of diversity. Well, I have a project that I'm comparing the chemical diversity and the biologic microbial diversity and how that equates, which is uh, now we have these non target approaches that allow us to do that, like the high through sequencing in genomics. Uh, we can also do similar things in, in chemical profiles. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Maria, and thanks to all the speakers. <laughs> so we will go for a coffee break. Uh, it's in the same patio as we had uh, lunch, and then we'll be back at five for three more talks.